So, okay, then welcome the four of you. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity for you to, to have a lot of questions and, and just have an open mic or raise a hand. So the less people here, the more questions you can give to this today's topic. And the topic is basically seven habits uh, every Azure admin must have. And we have these two people from the Netherlands. They are sure. probably sure. will tell us more yeah. of each other. And it's one, it's Carl de Winter and Wim Methusen. I'm not sure it's, if I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, it's for us. <laughs> and uh, to not take the time too much, I give you the stage and you do what you going to do. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, let me first share my screen. We're from Belgium, not from the We're from Belgium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's, a, it's that small country beneath the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the country with the three governments, yeah. Uh, yeah, more <laughs> even, I think. Uh, I think I everyone is seeing my screen at the moment. Carl, yes. you should have control also. Yeah, okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone, from uh, Carl and myself. And uh, yeah, welcome to our session uh, titled uh, Seven Habits Every Azure Admin Must Have. Carl and myself already delivered this session before, but um, this is an updated version. So from time to time, we switched some habits. So this is the version from October. So people who already made saw the session or uh, afterwards look at the video, um, still hang on because there are some changes and uh, some new topics we had. And first of all, we also, uh, before going through the ag agenda, we want to thank Sebastian for uh, inviting us and giving us the opportunity to uh, deliver this session for the Azure Meetup uh, Berlin. So uh, on the agenda today, first we'll briefly talk about the responsibilities that the new uh, Azure or Cloud Administrator role entails. Uh, it's a new IT role. You now see a lot uh, within uh, companies. Then we will talk about the seven habits. Every one of those uh, Azure admins, in our opinion, should have. Um, and between those habits, we also have some, some demos. And at the end of the session, we will go through uh, some key takeaways to really focus on the things you should, uh, in our opinion, uh, remember about our session. And then completely at the end, we, I think we probably will still have some time uh, to do a Q&A uh, where we would love to answer any of your questions. So. Let us get started with the short introduction. So my name is Wima Thessen and I live in Belgium and I work uh, as a cloud architect at the moment. I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer, so I deliver all kinds of uh, Azure workshops and training. Um, community wise, I'm a founding board member of a Belgium uh, user group called MC2MC, which stands for uh, Microsoft Cloud and Client Management Community. And it's a user group focusing on uh, Azure and the complete Microsoft 365 stack. Um, I also have my own blog, uh, httpswematester.com, uh, where I blog a lot about my daily experience, mostly with Azure and all related Microsoft uh, hybrid cloud services. Um, since July of this year, I'm also awarded as a Microsoft Azure MVP, uh, which still is a great honor for me. And like most IT professionals these days, I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So if you ever want to reach out, have a question, or yeah, even just want to say hi, you can always uh, contact me through my Twitter handle at Zwematese. So that's me in a nutshell, and I will uh, let do uh, Carl introduce himself. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and thanks for having us uh, at the uh, online Azure Meetup from Berlin. So in short, my name is Karel de Winter, and I'm a technology consultant Azure working for a Belgium company called Savaco. I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and a member of the Tech9 user group. So that's a Belgium user group also, uh, but different from the MC to MC. And if you want to reach out to me, uh, please do so on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, and you can find uh, the details here. So probably some of you took uh, their first steps in IT, working as a support or system engineer, or uh, even as a system administrator for a company who owns their own on-premises data center and infrastructure. But as an on-premises sysadmin, yeah, you then were probably responsible for, uh, yeah, I think almost everything in the data center. You not only needed to keep all servers up to date and do all the new servers and application installations, 
but you probably also needed to do uh, all the cabling and uh, the racking and the stacking of the servers and uh, yeah even troubleshoot almost every IT related problem from simple office problems still uh, yeah server crashes and stuff like that um, but in this modern hybrid cloud worlds where uh, cloud is becoming more important for uh, yeah, almost every business uh, this is that mean role is going to transform in something else it will um, kind of evolve into a cloud admin role or in case of Azure, uh, an Azure administrator role. For, uh, and for a lot of people, this will sound like they're going to lose their job or their role is going to be uh, less important. Uh, but in fact, it's more a case of how more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, in their changed role, they will still will be responsible for not only building, managing, uh, protecting, automating and optimizing this new hybrid cloud environment, um, just like it before when they yeah, only worked on premises. And this because the cloud doesn't run itself. Um, depending on which cloud service model you run your workloads, is it EaaS, uh, PaaS, uh, serverless or SaaS, there will also always be a, a shared responsibility. Um, where Microsoft, in case of Azure, will manage everything till a certain point, but you as an Azure admin or a cloud admin also have some responsibility. Um, this can be managing your EAS VMs by foreseeing them from Windows updates, uh, antivirus or backup, or only managing the databases in the data, for example, um, when you're running Azure SQL databases. So, let us now go ahead uh, with some of those habits uh, that those uh, Azure admins must have, in our opinion. So, uh, Carl, you can start with telling you everyone about uh, the first one, I think. Yeah. So, the first habit. So, if you want to manage and protect your Azure environment, what tools do you need? And what if you don't have a PC to log on to the to the Azure portal? Well, let me show you how you can remain in control. So if you are working with Azure, you should have some kind of Azure toolkit to manage uh, the, your environment. So first of all, maybe a quick question. I know you, you, there are not a lot of people in the, in the Teams call, but um, maybe by raise of hands and Teams, did someone ever rolled out some test environment and woke up in the middle of the night to, uh, to realize that the environment is still running and uh, yeah, Maybe, uh, yeah, so I have a couple of people that have the same problem um, as me because I have to raise my hand also. Um, but uh, I was saved by some cool tools and let me uh, tell you something about them. Um, one that you know all is the portal.azure.com, uh, but do you know there is also a portal app you can install on your PC? So with that, you can connect to the Azure portal without the need for a, for a browser. So for example, from a management server that is running Windows Server 2019, um, you don't need a browser uh, to run the app. Eh? You, can, you can just install the app and the look and feel is completely the same when you're uh, working from the portal. And there is also a specific portal to manage Azure AD. So if you only work with Azure Active Directory and you don't want to see any other resources, you can uh, access the Azure Active Directory admin center with this, uh, with this portal and the specific links are on the slide deck. And if you want to test out some new features, you can use the preview portal. So it's preview.portal.azure.com, but be aware that you don't use preview features in production uh, because you don't get support from Microsoft. And then uh, if something breaks, yeah, you have a problem and you are on your own. And luckily I could use the uh, the mobile app that saved me that night. Um, the, via the app, I could manage my uh, resources via my phone, uh, even at night. So uh, I just had to pick up my phone. Um, and I had installed the app already. So if you haven't installed the app, do it now because it will save you some money sometime and then you will maybe thank us for that. Um, okay, so as you can see, this is uh, these are the other tools uh, that even Rambo would use if he was an Azure admin. So first of all, you have the Cloud Shell, very popular now. It's uh, 
it's a shell that you can run via a browser and within that shell you can uh, run some tools like docker like azure powershell like the azure cli uh, you can put some files on it so it's a uh, it's very good to know that that you can access that via browser. There is also the Azure Storage Explorer and the AZ Copy that you can use to transfer files between your workstation and Azure. There is a Windows Admin Center and there is now a preview in the Azure portal. So with Admin Center, you can manage your on-premises environment, but also your Azure environment like uh, configuring backups, uh, making uh, site recovery configurations and so on. I, I didn't click anything. <laughs> I think it was me by accident. OK, That's you have right. to go back to slides. Yeah, wait a moment. I will go back. Oh, OK, um, sorry. No problem. Yeah, no problem. There so, it is. Yeah, the other tools are my favorite one, Visual Studio Code. If you want to edit some PowerShell files or some JSON files, uh, you can use the um, yeah, the, the code editor from Microsoft and also Windows Terminal is very handy because you can put Windows within one terminal uh, and it could be PowerShell or Azure CLI. So, but what if you want to use those tools across multiple subscriptions? Well, for that, Azure Lighthouse brings you the, the capabilities of managing multiple subscriptions across uh, multiple tenants. So it's actually based on uh, delegating access to others uh, and Azure Lighthouse help you helps you to manage other environments whether you are an MSP or a large enterprise um, who is managing multiple customers so and see a lighthouse uses two technologies so first is the resource manager and second is Azure Active Directory and uh, the key technology behind lighthouse is that delegated resource management so you have your users or groups originating from your own tenant that would have access to the target subscription or even a resource group with uh, which is in a different tenant and what you get from Azure Lighthouse is that it will uh, provide you with cross tenant management without having to configure your users on all subscriptions or use the the other tools that are available so it can come in handy if you have uh, to manage and get access to a, a lot of customer subscriptions and i myself and wim work for a csp partner and for us that's a that's a very big win so for now let me show you something uh, about cloud shell um, if all things go well you can see my screen now so if you go to shell.azure.com you can uh, see that that there is a, a cloud shell that is so a shell that is running and from there you can basically do some uh, default commands uh, and as you can see we have PowerShell version 7 and it's PowerShell core so it's uh, underlaying it's in a Linux OS um, and from there you can like I said see that there is a PowerShell module installed and you can see that it will be the latest version. So I thought yesterday there was a new version 4.8.0. So you constantly getting uh, the latest updates of the of the modules, um, even the Azure CLI will be the latest version. So uh, and like I said, it's not only PowerShell, um, but also you can run Docker commands in it. And something good to know is that from within the, the shell, you can run uh, some scripts because uh, you, you have uh, something called a cloud drive that you can attach to your uh, shell. So to be um, specific, uh, a cloud drive is some file share that's located on a storage account. And from there, you can um, just go to Cloud Drive. And as you can see, I've put some uh, simple JSON file on it. And from there, you can even open Visual Studio Code, but it's an integrated code, of course, within the shell. And there you can edit your file 
and you have some context menu where you can save and close. And if you see in this button, you can also upload or download uh, the files. Okay, up to you, Wim. Okay, let me first share the slide again. So there it is. So as our second habit, um, we want to talk about remaining future proof, uh, but trying to think beyond the ass, uh, because where we are going, uh, we don't need VMs anymore. Um, when moving on-premises resources to Azure, uh, the first thing you need to think about in uh, the assessment phase is choosing the right uh, cloud migration approach uh, to really make your uh, cloud journey a success. You not only need to think if your business is ready to move to the cloud to Azure, but you also need to validate if your IT people, uh, the, the people who will manage the environment when it's migrated, have the right skills to support such an environment. Um, next to that, uh, the five R's can really help you to see how an on-premise workload or application uh, can, be can be migrated to Azure. Uh, first of all, you have rehost, or like most people know with lift and shift, where you simply put, pick up an on-premises server, is it physical or a VM, and just place it in Azure. You can also uh, refactor or re-architect, where um, you're going to rethink your workload before moving it to Azure um, to move it for a uh, you have to make it, for example, uh, high available or more scalable. You can also revise or replatform your workloads where you migrate your on-premise workloads to a path server. So, for example, you have a VM running with a SQL Server on it. So maybe you can uh, yeah, migrate those databases to uh, Azure SQL database or a managed instance, for example. You can also uh, rebuild or rewrite your application. And there is also an option to yeah, completely move or change your workloads uh, by uh, an existing SaaS application, for example. So depending, what we see a lot is that uh, depending on who initiates the move, is it uh, IT or is it business, mostly different types of one of the five R's is uh, used and being chosen. Um, when IT mostly initiates and when it's a timely timeline driven uh, migration, we see a lot of lift and shift as a first step. Uh, mostly when the trigger comes from a business perspective or, for, or from the business itself, you see more uh, people choosing for refactor, re-architecting or uh, completely rebuilt uh, as a migration scenario. So there are some resources that can help you choosing the right cloud migration uh, approach. Uh, first of all, you have the Microsoft Cloud Adop Adaption Framework or uh, CAF, like they say. It's a collection of documentation that provides you with uh, implement, implement, implementation best practices and tools. And then if you're architecting your new workloads, the Azure Architect Center is also a good resource. Um, here you can find um, all kinds of implementation examples which can really guide you in making a good design. So if it's a high level design or a low level, be sure to take a look at those. Of course, you can also use Azure Migrate. Maybe uh, some people already use it. Uh, it's an Azure service which can help you in uh, not only discovering, but also assessing and migrating any kind of on-premise workload to Azure. It's If it's running on a VMware form or is it running on Hyper-V, even physical servers, it can look at those and see what's the best migration strategy and even help you with uh, the migration itself. And if you're not that really sure how to get started with your cloud migration, you can always check out the uh, Azure Migration Program. Um, here you can find the right help just by asking uh, for guidance, or you can even contact a migration partner that can help you in your migration uh, journey. And a thing Carl and myself also want to mention is that uh, if you're not that familiar with all those designing things and really with uh, how you need to architect your environment, uh, there is a now a Microsoft Learn course available, which you can follow and uh, helping you to get familiar with the Azure landing architecture at enterprise scale and all the critical design areas. And uh, yeah, you need to take a look at when building and managing uh, your Azure environment. So 
when making your design, you also need to start, just like the title mentioned to, uh, uh, from our second topic, uh, to start thinking beyond EAS frames and try to use a more cloud optimized strategy. Um, you should look into uh, uh, container instances, uh, AKS, uh, app service, uh, fabric, Azure function, uh, or yeah, other Azure compute options. And, and this instead of just deploying or lifting and shifting VMs, um, the following flow chart uh, slide uh, can also be found in the Azure Architect Center, and yeah, it can help you to select the right candidate for uh, yeah any kind of compute service next to just an EAS VM. Sorry, uh, um, there is a question from Aditya. Yeah. You can open the mic if you want. Uh, can you get the presentation uh, or PDF of the or presentation after the session? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll, we will uh, make it available and um, Sebastian will share it at the meetup page, I think, Sebastian. So we will yes. make a PDF out of it and then the video is also available because everything is recorded. So you can uh, take a look at it at your own pace because probably it's a lot of uh, stuff we handle. But uh, we will make it available, so no problem. OK, thank you so much. So what I was saying, when you were making your first approach is, is just lift and shift. Um, then as in the second phase, you should always try to uh, yeah, not make the, the IaaS version of your VMs, not the end state. For example, you can switch from an IaaS file server to Azure Files, for example, or from an uh, EAS domain controller uh, to Azure Domain Services. And uh, for example, to replace your uh, EAS DNS server, maybe it's ma uh, DNS uh, workload is also running on your domain controller. You can start looking into uh, Azure DNS or uh, Azure DNS private zones. And for people still working with uh, print servers, you can now uh, use, for example, Universal Print to replace them. Um, it's still currently in public preview, so I won't advise you to use it in a production environment, but you can also all, always take a look at it and uh, try testing it out. So, Carl, up to you for the third one. Okay. I will keep some control. Yeah. yeah. There. So, so in the next topic, we are going to make sure we remain in control of our uh, Azure environment. Um, so based on a few questions we received from uh, from customers, we can demonstrate why governance and management is needed. So questions like, how are we going to make sure we know uh, who created what resources and when, and how do we make the, the data and services secure and according to certain standards that a, that a company must follow? Uh, for example, how do we know which department is responsible for certain services in Azure and which Azure regions do we choose to create our resources? Um, is everything available in there? So you see there are uh, several questions that we need to take into account when creating, managing and, and also securing an Azure environment. And when uh, a proper Azure governance model is followed, you can ensure that your teams are operating in a, in a secure and, and compliant environment. So one of the biggest challenges in, in a cloud environment is cost management. Uh, we need to make sure that we are suddenly not facing a very high bill because someone has created certain costly Azure resources. Uh, and we also need to be aware that there are a lot of opportunities to store data in Azure. So uh, that data that can be stored in, in different regions, uh, distributed worldwide. And if your company does not allow it for some legal reasons to store its data outside uh, the country which uh, which in it operates, then there must be a way to prevent that uh, the data being stored elsewhere. So. If we look at uh, the next slide, what does uh, Azure governance actually consist of? Well, we can use Azure blueprints to uh, to organize and, and structure our environment. We can also use tags and tagging. With, uh, with this, we add some metadata to our resources, which will give a, a logical format to our resources. And, and you have you have always uh, always used tags and tags like uh, owner, department, environment, that are very important tags that you know which resource is being used for what. Um, and we can also use uh, 
Airbag, which means uh, role-based access control. So we can uh, control what and by whom and where is something uh, happening in Azure. And yeah, obviously cost management gives us an insight into the, the, the really con consumption of the entire cloud environment. And we can use Azure policy um, to use, uh, yeah, to, to get us in control of the properties of the resources. And last but not least, very important, we also can use Azure Resource Graph. And that is a very fast and most efficient service um, to request all resources in Azure with certain filters on it. So with, uh, like I said, with the, with the Resource Graph, so you can, you can query, you can uh, explore and do some assessment of your Azure environment. And you can also uh, measure the impact of the Azure policy. So Azure Resource Graph is very powerful um, and comes in very handy. And those are some query examples you can use with, um, with, the, resource, uh, with, with the resource graph, uh, like get all the VMs by OS, get all the VMs by, by location, uh, and so on and so on. But just let me let me do a quick demo on on resource graph and show you how it uh, how it works because it's very powerful, and we'll use it uh, a lot. So here you can see I've opened already some some saved queries. Um, the first query is give me all the VMs by its location. So you can see I have uh, three VMs and then they are grouped by, by location. So one VM in, in West Europe and two VMs in East US. Um, and the second query is give me all the resources by, by the name. And something new here, you can, you can uh, format the result and then the type and uh, will be much readable. Um, so here, this can come in handy if you uh, want, if you do an assessment or something like that. Um, and this is also very powerful, get all the resources by type. So here also we can format the results and this you can export to a CSV and then simply um, get you a list of all the available resources in that environment and then see if you can, for example, migrate from one subscription to another subscription. So that's all for the demo. Back to you, Wim. Yeah, let me share my screen again. So, so as our fourth habit, uh, yeah, we want to look into Azure Cloud Spend and uh, how we can remain informed and in control of uh, all your cloud costs, because that's an important factor. Someone has to pay the bill at the end of the month, so um, you really need to take a look at that. Um, and first of all, you can start with uh, choosing the right subscription type. Uh, it's all, also an important step in a design process because they all have different rates, offers and uh, benefits. The ones mostly seen in companies these days are uh, enterprise or uh, yeah, they rename it to Microsoft customer agreements these days or CSP subscriptions, cloud service, uh, cloud service provider subscriptions. Um, when you're using one of those, the prices for your uh, Azure resources will be lower than when you're uh, just using a pay-as-you-go subscription. Uh, you should also be aware of all your other software licenses, uh, like those, for example, for uh, SQL. Uh, further know that when you have, for example, an enterprise agreement or uh, an MCA, uh, you can set up an uh, enterprise dev subscription where you get uh, special rates for some services like VMs and even uh, SQL databases. You should also know that uh, some services are always free to use. Um, yeah, some of those uh, with specific limitations. So if you start using any of those, really read the small small lines because yeah, otherwise you can be surprised at some time. Um, and for testing purposes, you should definitely take a look at uh, test test labs and uh, at the Azure Marketplace test drives. Um, for those who don't know, Azure Dev Tabs, uh, you don't know, you need to have to pay any additional cost to use the service. Uh, you simply use uh, for the VMs you're uh, using. And uh, test drives are uh, ready to go environments that allow you to experience a product for free without needing uh, an Azure subscription. So, for example, you already have an Azure subscription, and you want to uh, implement any kind of uh, next gen firewall. Let us say, for example, a FortiGate, or, or uh, you're not sure if you want your Palo Alto or, or a Cisco Meraki, for example, 
really look, uh, go to the Azure marketplace and look at those test drives. So probably you can test those out uh, for yeah, a couple of hours and even days for uh, zero uh, cost. So yeah, it's a good way to test uh, any of those uh, other marketplace offerings uh, out for free. So uh, another good way to lower your for your EAS payments cost is by uh, using uh, reserved instances, RIs, uh, where you make your reservation of resources and capa uh, capacity for either uh, one or uh, three years. And you can also uh, combine this with uh, the hybrid use benefit, in which you will um, use your existing Windows or even SQL licenses. Um, yeah, you should have uh, software assurance. That's an important factor um, for your uh, Azure VMs or uh, SQL servers uh, running in Azure. And a combination of both. So if you combine uh, RIs with uh, with Hub, uh, it can save you up to 82% uh, of your uh, Azure spend. Important to know is that uh, you can not only use uh, Azure reservation for VMs these days, uh, but also for uh, SQL and even for uh, premium SSD managed disks or uh, for SQL databases or for uh, even for uh, SUSE Linux or for your app services. And uh, yeah. So look at those because there are, these days there are a lot of services available. Which, uh, yeah, if you reserve reservate them, uh, you can really lower uh, your cost at the end of the month. Of course, there are still a lot of other ways to keep your cost down in Azure. Um, first of all, yeah, before start deploying anything, uh, you can uh, estimate your cost in advance. Uh, uh, also, uh, a good point to start with when you're making a design. Um, Herefore, you can use the Azure pricing calculator and the total cost of ownership or a TCO calculator. Um, the TCO calculator is a tool to estimate uh, cost savings you can uh, re realize by migrating your on-premises workloads to Azure. Uh, and when you're working on your high level or low level design, you should also keep an eye on uh, any design decisions which can uh, impact your costs. Um, for example, a resource cost a resource can cost less when deployed to a different region, for example, or when you decide to use GRS, it's more expensive than, for example, choosing LRS. Um, then you can also delete all unused Azure resources because I do a lot of assessments on uh, customer uh, environments, and uh, a lot of times they're just starting uh, spinning up resources, uh, test things out, but they don't delete them, but they're still running, and in the end of the month, they still need to pay for them. Um, things we see a lot still being run in environments is, for example, our public IP addresses. They cost around 100 euros and yeah, they still exist whenever they're not used anymore. Um, you can also look at uh, if you're running EAS VMs at uh, auto shutdown, if your VMs don't need to run 24 7 or uh, they just need to run during business hours, you can start and stop them because uh, you only need to pay for, uh, yeah. The, the runtime, like they say. You can uh, use the start stop solution in Azure Automation, but you can also now use, uh, there's a new option available when you right click on your VM, um, where you can uh, use a logic app to start in the back from Microsoft to, to start and stop those VMs. So look at those also. So Azure also has a built free tool to use for uh, which can help you with uh, managing your costs, and that's uh, Azure Cost Management. Um, it can really help you to monitor and manage your costs, and this across all your clouds, even if you're running AWS. Um, you can even uh, yeah, manage and uh, yeah, get those costs in, uh, in, in place. Uh, you can uh, also do uh, any cost analysis, make budgets and uh, put in cost alerts. So when a, a specific amount of money is spent on a specific resource that you get an email and you get notified that uh, yeah, those uh, resource group and those resources running in that specific resource group are going above a specific amount of money. Um, and if you want to look at uh, yeah, the new features added to uh, Azure cost management, you can also use uh, the uh, go to the Azure people portal like uh, uh, Carl already mentioned, and uh, look into uh, cost management labs. Um, I think Carl also managed Azure policy. It's it's an element of your uh, Azure governance strategy. Uh, so Azure policy next to Azure cost management can help you to uh, keep your, uh, yeah, to stay in control of your costs. Um, you can set up specific policies to implement uh, a form of cost control and, and uh, yeah, a way to guardrail your environment. 
Um, you, for example, you can set a policy which allows only the deployment of certain VM sizes in your environment or uh, even restrict the creation of public IPs. Um, you can also enforce that specific resource stacks like the cost at the center, for example, are always required when the resource is deployed. Or uh, you can also set a policy that uh, only allows the deployment of resources in a specific region. So, for example, you only want uh, resources to be, to be deployed in the West Europe region. Just create that specific policy and people won't be able to uh, yeah, deploy any resources in any other re uh, re uh, regions. So, but let me quickly demo it. Um, so, for example, if you want to open Azure policy, um, you can use a global search bar and just go type in policy. Sorry, typo. Um, you can open it. If it's once to open. So you can see I already have some policies in place. For example, I have specific uh, allow this to use for VM sizes. I also um, have a policy in place that doesn't allow the creation of a, a VPN gateway with the basic uh, SKU. So that it should be a VPN gateway one. But if you look at this one, at the SKUs, for example, um, let us open it. If you um, edit the assignments, for example, and we look at the parameters, you can see I have specific SKUs and I have selected some, and people are only allowed to deploy uh, that specific uh, VM sizes in, in the, the environment. Um, policies you can apply on a management group level, you can uh, apply them at subscription level and at specific resource group level. So try them out. It's, it's simple. There are a lot of building uh, policies available uh, which can really help you to get in control of your environment. And this not only from a cost perspective. Um, if you look at Azure cost management, just in the sidebar, open cost management and billing or just type it in in uh, the global search bar. If you open it, just click on cost management. A nice thing I want to show you. Um, you also, for example, you can set those alerts over here. You can do the cost analysis. Uh, you can set the budget. It's all integrated in one central plane. Um, but for example, it will always also give you advice um, for uh, things that can optimize your cost or lower your cost at the end of the month. For example, I have a specific public IP address running in my environment that's not connected to any resources. Um, in the back, Azure Cost Management is also integrated in Azure Advisor and will give you that file from over here. If I just click on it, there's a simple quick fix. Um, that specific uh, PIP is not used anymore. Um, it will redirect me directly to that specific address and I just can click on delete and it will save me around uh, 100 euros at my Azure bill at the end of the month. So really try to use those things. It can really save you some money. And I think, Carl, with that being said, um, you can take over for uh, part five. Yeah. Okay. So, so when do you know? You yeah. Yeah. So when do you know when when things are going wrong in Azure? And yeah, believe me, those things can happen. Um, well, with Azure Service Health, you uh, you get a personalized view um, of Azure services that uh, that matter to us so it's a free service that can notify you if issues that are impacting of issues that are impacting uh, your environment uh, and it's also what um, shows you the health of the resources that that you use so the service will also inform you um, how microsoft is fixing those issues and it it will keep you updated when those uh, issues are uh, are resolved so within service health, we have different, so three different, uh, let me go back one slide. So we have three different um, services. Uh, you, you, can, you can have uh, plant maintenance. Um, when the, you can see when plant maintenance is going on uh, for your VMs. And it will also give you uh, health advisories to inform you when certain Azure services are deprecated or if you exceed a, a usage quota, for, for example. And good to know is that, that uh, the service health integrates also with Azure Monitor uh, to uh, give you alerts via text, email or, or messages or even a, a webhook notification. 
So next is Azure Advisor. So Wim also uh, already showed you a little bit and told you a little bit about Advisor, but Advisor is also a free service and it will provide you with some personalized recommendations and also best practices for your uh, Azure environment, for your subscriptions and resources. So those recommendations, th those can be customized so that only recommendations are shown from, for example, uh, specific subscriptions or specific resource groups that are most important to you. And it can show you recommendations also from different resources, such as virtual machines, uh, application gateways, app services, SQL service, and so on and so on. So it delivers these recommendations by, by uh, analyzing the, the underlying data via uh, Azure Monitor services, uh, and it provides recommendations based on that um, service. So you can also use Azure Advisor alerts uh, to get you notified um, when, for example, an, an advisor alert is triggered. Something new is the Azure Advisor score. So the advisor score is calculated on a, on a scale from, from 0 to 100% in each uh, of the five categories. So a score of 100% means that all your resources tracked by advisor follow all the best practices. And a score of zero means that uh, that none of your resources follow the recommendations and, and recommended best practices. So for that, Advisor is your uh, personalized cloud consultant, and it's also free. And later on, I will show you uh, some Azure service health, but uh, for next is, is uh, our free service, Azure Security Center. Um, Security Center is your first thing that you have to, um, to do when you need a, secu a total security overview of your Azure environment. And it will give you also recommendations on how specific resources can improve uh, security configurations. So a lot has changed since uh, Ignite this year. Uh, as you all know, Security Center is uh, offered in, in a free edition and a standard edition, but Azure Security Center Standard Edition uh, has changed uh, names, so it's now called Azure Defender. And if you want to use Security Center for, for servers, then it will be called Azure Defender for servers. If you want to use it for, uh, for example, storage account, then it will, um, it, it will be called Azure Defender for storage. So for that, um, Security Center is still offered in two modes, but with uh, those have another name. So it's Azure Defender Off, which is the free edition, or Azure Defender On, which is the, the standard and paid edition. So Security Center without Azure Defender, so the Azure Defender Off, is enabled for free on all your, all your Azure subscriptions when you visit the Security Center dashboard for the first time. And enabling, so putting Azure Defender on, extends the capabilities of, of the free mode uh, and will detect and protect your workloads against threats and is also provided with a built-in protection for your hybrid cloud workloads. So, also, a new addition to, uh, to Security Center is the workflow automation, and that allows you to automatically uh, react and trigger workflows based on certain conditions, like an incident response or when a security recommendation uh, is generated. But let me show you just a, a quick demo of Service Health, and let me show you how it works. So if you want to see the, the health uh, of our services, so of all the Azure services that are relevant in our environment, uh, then that's something that we can see in the service health. So this is just an, a dashboard that I've made. And as you can see, um, we, we have a little map here with two green dots. So the, the query that I've executed uh, just a, a couple of minutes ago, you, you could see that I have three VMs. So in this region, all my VMs are okay. And the East US, everything is okay also. So if you go to service health, we can see here the service issues. Those issues are uh, everything that is uh, Azure service related. Um, 
so there is only one issue i think yeah but if we want to see some more issues that are happened then they have been a lot of issues i think uh, lately with yeah. azure active directory and devops and things like that so we could see here uh, some issues i think so you can filter in the health history on uh, on some time range like uh, last month and from there you can pick uh, a health uh, so a service issue and then you can see what microsoft did so you can see the root cause analysis you can see what the engineers have been done you can see the updates um, and you can see what they've done uh, to resolve the issue so it's very helpful but those uh, issues are only for all azure re, uh, azure services so what about uh, only the services that we use in our and in, in our tenant and our subscription so for that, for example, let me just filter um, to virtual machine. So I only, I only select the research type virtual machine. So I can see I have one resource, so one VM with an issue. And if I click on that, you can see the health history. And indeed, you can see that the, the issue is that the, the VM has been stopped or deallocated and it's customer initiated. So it's very important. It was me that, uh, had had uh, stopped the VM, so it's it's true that I've stopped the VM, and I've uh, yeah initiated a, a service uh, issue. So you can also get some alerts that are triggered when a service issue is uh, is, is triggered. So you can also um, use the same alerts that you use in Azure Monitor, so via mail or or text or uh, webhooks. Uh, from here, so you you you've been informed when some some issue is um, is occurred, and let me show you just quickly security center. But I don't know in my demo environment if you can see. Yeah, there is a, a secure score that can help you uh, improve um, also the the complete security environment. And as you can see, the new name Azure Defender is also uh, stated here. So that's all for this demo. Okay, let me take control again. So everyone should be seeing my screen again. Okay, so for our uh, sixth habit, um, we want to look into uh, securing hybrid connections so you can uh, remain secure when uh, connecting uh, to your Azure environment. Like probably most of you know, uh, the easiest way, but yeah, the least secure one to connect to an Azure VM is by using a public IP address or its PIP. Uh, in this way, you can connect to any AS VM through RDP on port uh, 338 or SSH on port 22, depending if the VM is a uh, Windows VM or a Linux VM. Um, this kind of way of connecting to your Azure VMs is good for uh, studying purposes or when you need to do a quick test but you should never use it to connect to your VMs in a production environment because um, by using this way to connect to your VMs, one or both of, of those management ports will be widely opened on the internet. And in this way, your VM can easily be attacked with brute force attacks, um, port scanning, or even uh, zero day exploits. So in production environments, you need to uh, connect to your Azure resources through a hybrid connection with a uh, high security like a point to site VPN or uh, a site to site VPN or uh, an express route. So a resource we still also see a lot being used in a production environment is a jump box or a jump post or a jump server like some people like to name it. Uh, jump box is a server, uh, you can see it as a controlled entry point into your Azure environment, which is used to access uh, other in a separated security zone or uh, in one of the spoke vnets if you're working in the hub spoke model. So when you use such a jump box, it's best to enable uh, just-in-time VM access uh, or JIT for it. So you can really control uh, the access and reduce the attack surface uh, to this jump box. Um, JIT is available when you use the Azure Defender on, like Carl already mentioned there of uh, Azure Security Center. So you need to pay for it. And uh, how does it work? Uh, first of all, a user needs to request access to a VM and then security center in the back checks if that specific user who's asking uh, re uh, access has a, a specific role-based access permission uh, for that VM. If so, 
that request is approved and then security center automatically configures the NHD and this to allow uh, yeah, inbound traffic to, for example, one of the management ports uh, like 3389 or 22. And, uh, and this for the requested amount of time. And when that specific time window is passed, Azure Security Center will uh, automatically restore energy back to its previous state and uh, not allowing access anymore. So these days, uh, you can also use uh, Azure Bastion to securely connect to your uh, Azure VMs. Um, for people who don't know, uh, Azure Bastion is a path service that you uh, provision inside your virtual network. And it uh, will provide you with um, secure and seamless RDP and SSH connectivity um, to your virtual machines, but this directly from inside the Azure, the Azure portal uh, over SSL. Um, how does it work? Well, um, Azure Bastion uh, lives in its own subnet, um, the Azure Bastion subnet um, in your VNet, uh, which exposes only port 443 uh, SSL uh, to the internet. And through your Bastion host, you connect with uh, RDP uh, 3289 or SSH22 on the private IP address of uh, your VMs. And in this way, your VMs itself don't need a public IP anymore uh, to connect from it uh, from outside. But let me quickly demo this. So let me go to my Azure portal if it wants to close. OK, so there it is. So you can see my sidebar I already have a Bastion host. Let me show it. It's a Bastion host. It's deployed in a specific VNet. Um, these days you can already use VNet pairing. So normally you should only create one Bastion host in your complete uh, subscription and you can connect to any paired VNet. Um, so deploy it in your hub network and then connect to all your uh, spoke VNets, I would say. Um, if you want to use it, let me open my virtual machine blade for a moment. Um, yeah, I have some v VMs running. For example, I have my VM. It's a Windows VM. Just click on the connect button. You can see the RDP SSH, but you also have the Bastion option. Just click on the Bastion option. Um, just click on use Bastion. Then just type in the password, uh, username. So let me type in my username and then my super secret password. I hope I will type it correctly. Password one two three four. <laughs> uh, it's not that easy. <laughs> so you click on the connect button. You click on the allow for the first one, and then you will see my password was wrong, so I can't open it. Let me try it again with another one. Let me type third one. So once again, just click on Bastion. Just use Bastion, or otherwise my username is changed also overnight. Um, let me see if I type it correctly now. And you click on the connect button. And still not show. Ah, there it is. This one was the correct one. So you can see you can uh, yeah, do all your management stuff you want to do in your VM and then just directly from a, a, no, a new open tab uh, through the Azure Bastion nodes. You just set it up. It's a password. It will take, if you do it through Azure PowerShell, it will deploy in five minutes, I think. The only thing you need to take a look at is uh, if you uh, use uh, NHDs combined with the Azure Bastion, all the specific uh, ports you need and, and opens um, the rules should be in place. Otherwise, the deployment will fail. A nice option you have is also if you go to the Bastion nodes and you're the Azure admin. Um, I now have an open connection like you can see. Just click on that specific host and under settings, if you go to sessions, you can see there is, yeah, it's still loading. There are some sessions open. And as an admin, you can even uh, drop this one and then uh, the connections will be gone. So you can you can see this one is connected and the, the, the person uh, yeah, managing that VM needs to uh, yeah, reconnect or stuff like that. So you can keep really keep in control of your environment. So let me go back to my slide deck. One so, question from me, the Bastion, do you know what is the praising based on? Is it compute or just by it's, laying it's, there? Uh, the Azure Bastion host itself, it costs you around, if you do it in euros, it's uh, 190 euros. The only thing you should also keep in mind is the outbound data. So the first five gigs are free. So for most environments, that should be enough. 
and then the pricing has a specific price for the outbound data and then yeah it, it goes from 5 to 100 gigs i think and then from 100 gigs to 500 and then from 500 and the price lowers by that but also keep that one mind it's not only uh, for the host itself it's all for for uh, the data but i think in most environments you should get around with five gigs i think you uh, yeah there are better ways to manage your vms also where eh? you also now have uh, for example um yeah call help me um i can't come on the name at the moment um windows admin center is also integrated yeah. in the azure portal so you can also do your management from over there yeah. or you can use cloud shell and then yeah you can do everything from in there also you can integrate with your vms and can manage them it's it's if you want to do it visually and for most people it's the most familiar way how to manage service eh? it's it's growing in time if you just want to rdp or SSH, yeah, it's it's now 190 euros yeah that's not that high of a price in your azure environment so yeah think of it and the thing is you don't need to manage your uh, jump host anymore eh? If you set up a jump post, you still need to manage it. You need to foresee security, um, update management, stuff like that. That's also with a specific price. So probably the Azure Bastion host yeah, would be easier way to do it. OK, thanks. Yeah. So and as our last habit, uh, we want to look into how you can secure cloud identities and uh, foresee a good cloud identity and management strategy. Um, why securing Azure identity is that important these days? Um, well, because these days there are all kinds of Azure threats where attackers may use uh, existing techniques, like for example, uh, social engineering, where attacker tries to man manipulate someone to give up uh, confidential information, or uh, you have ransomware, a kind of malware which encrypts a company's files or data, after which then the attacker demands a ransom to the company to restore access to the data. Um, but there are also some new technique attackers or hackers like to use, um, like uh, acquire Azure tenant keys from GitHub or where an attacker tries to get into an Azure VM by use of a brute force or uh, RDP SSH password spray attacks. And for example, when you're running, uh, still running a web server in Azure EAS here for, and that specific server is breached, attackers can use it to install uh, crypto mining malware and use that for a uh, Cryptocurrency are mining, for example, so uh, it's a really important. Um, this slide shows some of the examples of identity breaches. Um, for example, you can see the top 20 most popular used passwords by employees. So try those out. Probably one will work, uh, which can be simply looked at from uh, opening a browser and look uh, to them uh, with Bing or, or Google, for example. A nice website also listed on the slide is for uh, haveibeenpound.com, um, where you can check if you have an account that has, a comp uh, has been compromised in a data breach. Um, just go to that specific site, uh, type in the email address you want to validate, and then the site in the back checks if that specific account is breached. And for some people, this can be really surprising, I would say. So try it out with every account you have, and yeah, you can see if one of those is breached. It's free to use, so go try it out. Um, so as an Azure administrator these days, um, you should try to follow a zero trust model um, because in most companies these days, you not only have uh, support access to data and services from inside the corporate firewall, but also from uh, outside of it. And by applying a zero trust model, a, a ZEM like they say, you never assume trust, uh, but instead you continually validate that specific trust. Um, and you will rely on uh, verifiable user and device trust claims and will grant access to resources uh, based on those specifically. And, and in this way, a trust is no longer assumed just based on the location inside of your organization's perimeter, but also from the outside. And then, and this is because most of your user now, yeah, with the COVID situation, uh, will uh, access apps and, and data from the internet, like for example, all your Azure workloads, or they start using uh, Teams to do calls and then share data and, and documents from there. So uh, really keep that one in mind. So there are some resources and tools that can help you uh, with protecting your Azure identities. Um, yeah, first of all, like Carl also mentioned, already mentioned, is a role-based access control. 
uh, which can help you to control who can uh, access, edit, modify or delete Azure resources. And this based on the least uh, privileged access model. You can, all, if you have a specific uh, yeah, Azure AD license, you can also use uh, Azure AD Private Identity Management or PIM, um, which is a service that enables on-demand, uh, just-in-time administrative access to uh, Microsoft Online services. Um, like I said, PIM is available if you have, uh, I think it's an Azure AD Premium P2 license, or if you have an uh, EMS E5 license, or even uh, a Microsoft 365 Education A5 license. Um, so if you have one of those licenses, really check out PIM. It can really help you to um, yeah, more secure your uh, privileged identity. So uh, users like the global admins or a specific user who needs to do tasks uh, on your environment, uh, try to uh, protect them with, uh, with PIM. Another tool you can use is uh, Azure AD Conditional Access. Um, Conditional access is an Azure Active Directory tool uh, that you can use to manage and control access to uh, all your corporate resources. If they're running on-prem or uh, if they're running in Azure, it really doesn't matter. Um, to use conditional access, you also need to have a specific license. And in this, uh, you need at least have a Azure AD Premium P1 license or a Microsoft 365 Business Premium license. And uh, last but not least, you should enable MFA if you're not uh, already using it. Um, and because, yeah, you can these days, you can even do it for free. So put that on and uh, it can really help you protect any identity, cloud identity you're uh, using. Um, so you can see managing identity security for your Azure environment can, a big, can be a big task. Um, luckily, you can now also simply enable Azure AD security defaults. Uh, which makes it easier uh, to help protect you from identity related attacks uh, with pre configured security settings uh, recommended by Microsoft. Uh, like there are, for example, um, requiring all users to register for Azure uh, multi factor authentication or uh, blocking legacy authentication protocols. The only thing you should really keep in mind is that you have already implemented uh, conditional access and you have any conditional access policies enabled in your environment. Those uh, security defaults won't be available to you. Um, but let me quickly show you how to enable them. Let me close the Bastion links. Um, you just need to go to your Azure Active Directory. Then click on Properties. Go totally to the bottom, click on Manage Security Defaults, and you can simply put them on if they're not still uh, in, uh, enabled. You can do it for free, and it will yeah, really protect your environment from, a, yeah, from a, a simple uh, click with a mouse you need to do. So if you're not uh, enabled it yet, and you're not running any of those other identity tools that can uh, really help your identities, uh, just enable this one, and it will already uh, get you on your way. So let me take back my slide. So before closing off, uh, we just want to give you some uh, key takeaways. Uh, in our opinion, five things you should really remember about the session of today. Um, so first of all, it's really time these days, it's really time to modernize your workload. So when moving to Azure, uh, try to think beyond the ask where possible. Also, uh, apply a good Azure governance strategy so you can uh, remain in control of your Azure environments. Um, third, uh, keep an eye on your cloud spend because yeah, at the end of the month, uh, someone has to pay the Azure bill. Also, use all Azure free built-in Azure services and tools like Azure Advisor, Azure Service Health, uh, Azure Cost Management, and the Azure Security um, Defender off tier. Uh, and this to better manage and protect your Azure environment. And uh, last but not least, know that uh, identity uh, is a new security parameter and that you should really try to secure and really try to secure all your uh, cloud identities. So with this, I think we come up to the Q&A. So if anyone has a question, just shout and ask it. It's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of topics we covered, so. <laughs> it was <Yeah>. clear. <laughs> I hope it was a little bit clear. 
it was well presented i guess um but i also i think people can also contact you guys on on twitter yeah, I yeah. Guess. No, problem. no problem um and when i send the, the the slides later um in the slide you have your twitter handle yep, anyways, there it is so. that's why i was uh, going to so, that so do you use azure bastion already sebastian I have used it uh, at some point. I was in in when I was in Schindler. We mm -hmm. we were evaluating and using it because we had a traditional jump host with the VM. Mm -hmm. It was mostly like a hybrid, and uh, so yes, we were using that um, for if you had to go with RDP. But we also had uh, express routes with the internal network, yeah, yeah, and okay. only had to connect through VPN with internal IPs. Yeah. yeah. That's also secure. Yeah. Yeah. And then Azure Bastion was only used as a last resort if you're yeah. not in the network and you really had to go. Yep. So when I'm working from home, I also sometimes use a point of site VPN to connect to customers' environments because in that way uh, you can even integrate it with Azure AD these days and you can uh, yeah do it with your uh, with certificates. So it's it's really it's, yeah it's it's a way you have some options. Azure Bastion is just, in my opinion, the simplest and the easiest way. Mm -hmm. You just need to, yeah, and, and now with the VNet peering and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you just yeah. set up one and, yeah, you can manage every, yeah, if you're still running VMs in Azure, you I mean, can take that, control of those. I thought Azure Bastion is one of the uh, easiest to use past tools in Azure, yeah, yeah. like uh, yeah. from setup time and then just uh, using uh, it. Uh, I have a complete script with it, with with even the NSGs directly in place, and I can spin one up in uh, three, four minutes, I think. Hmm. You should create hey, your GitHub and, account. Yeah, <laughs> you need to write one. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> the trick is, you, you can set it up, do your do your work, and then oh. drop it again, and then <laughs> when you need it again, yeah. spin it up again. Huh? Like, yeah. then you don't need to pay the complete amount over yeah. the complete month. True. That's the trick. Okay. Yeah. It will Actually be a good very idea. popular. Actually a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that way you're always compliant. <laughs> at, le at least most of the time. Yeah, yeah I do a lot of cost uh, cost optimization assessment. So I learn all those small tricks and it can really make a difference at mm -hmm. the end of the month when you need to pay a bill. So yeah, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, I know most of the tools, some I didn't know. So it's really nice to have them. There is a, Aditya has a question. Just just open the mic. Uh, not really a question. Uh, okay. Just want to thank Carol and Wim for the session. Uh, you guys have been down the years of experience in a just our session. That was wonderful. Uh, I'm from Nepal. Uh, it's me already midnight here, but really enjoyed your session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. See you next time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so then I guess since there are no more questions and they can contact you later, I really thank you for the session. And if you ever want to do a session again, it's always open our site. So since we are now remote here. Yeah, you have all <laughs> yeah. email addresses. So yeah. I have an uh, Azure Bestia yeah. session, by the way. We <laughs> focused on that and it's, it's, it's a popular one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I keep that in mind. Tricks. Yeah. I keep in yeah. mind. And I have yeah. some, some others with Carl, so we have, uh, yeah. Yeah. Then, we have some in our uh, portfolio. Yeah. 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 So then, then really thank you and thank you all for coming to all the attendees and then spread the word. We do more of these sessions also. So then, and you see soon on uh, uh, YouTube, I will message that on Meetup and Twitter and then you all can just watch it and also the ones who haven't seen it. Okay. 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 Thank you and for having us. And, uh, thank you very much. Bye bye. And have a good Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you too. Have Bye. a nice day. Bye.